Hi, everybody. Uh, this is the third of three mini lectures on climate change mitigation. Uh, this time we're going to be taking a very big picture look at the whole world um, and uh, the processes that govern uh, CO2 emissions on it using something called the Kaya identity. This should be a short one, so stay tuned. Um, once again, as a reminder, uh, we're focusing on climate change mitigation now, what we can do to prevent climate change rather than merely dealing with the consequences. Uh, the global impact of the consequences is also vast, um, and we've seen that on a local scale with the Marian sea level rise activity. Anyway, to take a look at the Kaya identity. The idea here is to extract away from technologies and policies and the details of uh, you know controlling climate change and focus on the major factors that drive co2 emissions and we're looking specifically at co2 caused by energy use um, burning fossil fuels for electricity and transportation rather than things like uh, fossil fuels from say agriculture all right, um, and basically the Kaya identity uh, is uh, includes the uh, factors at the uh, bottom of the screen here. Um, basically, the idea is this is not rocket science here. Uh, this is not even any real physical dynamics. It's really just about definition. All right, they calculate the amount of carbon emissions given by the world. Um, you need to think about first world population. The more people there are, the more everything there is, right? Second, uh, gross domestic product per capita. This is all about how active the economic system is and how much money there is in the world. Broadly speaking, the more wealth there is in the world, the more your ability to buy energy. Third, this is where things start to get a little tricky. Uh, energy intensity of gross domestic product, all right? Um, every dollar's worth of GDP uh, that are generated in a country came along with some amount of energy use, whether that energy was coal or electricity, maybe you can convert back and forth between them, but you had to do energy in order to do that part of the economy, all right? How much energy is used for each dollar of GDP? And finally, um, the fourth factor is what we call the carbon intensity of energy, which is how much CO2 is generated for each unit of energy. And as we talked about in our last mini lecture, um, that depends on which fuels you're using, coal versus natural gas, it depends on how, how much um, renewable energy you're using or not using. All right, so all the stuff about technologies and um, that sort of thing was largely encapsulated in this fourth factor. Um, the reason that this is important is because it focuses attention away from the details of wind panel, wind, wind panels, solar panels and wind turbines um, and focuses on the broader societal factors and economic factors that drive carbon dioxide emissions and focuses attention on some that you don't necessarily think about so much, all right? In particular, um, major focus that people think about all the time when with respect to environmentalism and combating climate change is carbon intensity, which is to say, can we switch to better energy technologies? We also think a little bit about efficiency um, and uh, conservation and trying to do more with less energy. That's the energy intensity bucket, the third of these, all right? But what gets very little attention is the key role that's played by population, which gets spent in a little time, and also wealth, all right? The first and second pictures. So let's take a closer look at projections for where all of these factors are likely to be headed in the future. All right. Uh, oh, actually, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the point is with these four different levers give us different ideas about how we can reduce carbon emissions. All right. Um, so the population lever, 
um, is pretty obvious. Uh, we can make an attempt to limit population growth so there aren't as many people producing CO2 emissions. Um, that is definitely possible, uh, but the history of attempts to politically control population growth have, there's a long and dangerous set of stories there. Um, it may be possible, it may be advisable, but it comes with serious potential risks to civil rights um, and, uh, you know, uh, human well-being. All right, GDP per capita. Uh, the more wealth people have, the more able they are to buy energy, whether it's fossil fuels or renewables or whatever. Um, more wealth means more energy use. It's just the way it is, right? How do you combat that? Well, should you? Because to reduce GDP per capita means increasing poverty, all right? If people are too poor to be able to buy uh, fossil fuels, then that's good for the planet, but I'm not sure it's worth it. And it's definitely not good for the people who are in that situation. Um, and uh, you may be thinking about, uh, you know, reducing Jeff Bezos's wealth, which is great, um, but Jeff Bezos only produces a limited amount of carbon dioxide and, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, the little guys um, are producing the lion's share of the, G of the um, account for the lion's share of GDP per capita and also the lion's share of the emissions. All right, third factor uh, for potentially reducing carbon emissions is uh, we can change the way we run our economy, all right, by switching to uh, economic ventures that involve less use of energy overall. For example, computer software, entertainment, um, a lot of the stuff the US actually does. The world, US is one of the world leaders in energy intensity. Um, many of the ways that we have found to power our economy uh, use a lot less energy than countries that are relying on factories and other large um, uh, industrial infrastructure. That industrial infrastructure ends up going places like us, uh, like towards the US. Um, but overall, if we can shift the world economy away from heavy industry and towards um, less energy using um, business sectors, and they make a big difference, All right? And finally, the one that, that people pay the most attention to is transitioning to energy sources that use less CO2 and reduce the carbon intensity. So what are these store, four factors likely to look at like uh, in the future? I'm taking these data from a uh, interactive climate model that's gonna be the focus of our last assignment uh, in the last week of class. So uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of this in just a little bit, all right? So this is a prediction through the year 2100 of CO2 emissions in the energy sector um, rising from 25 or 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide in the year 2000 up to 80. Um, just about tripling uh, over the course of 100 years. And the Kaya identity allows us to break down the factors that are leading to that huge rise in energy in CO2 emissions, all right? And uh, we obtain that graph by multiplying together the real results of four other graphs. First, global population it was about 6 billion people in the year 2000 and is focused forecast by the UN to increase quite dramatically in the early part of this century, but then begin to flatten out in the later part of the century as better access to technology and rising wealth lowers birth rates. People will have less kids if they feel like A, all of those kids can survive to adulthood, and B, they aren't crucially reliant on those kids to take care of them in old age. There are reasons why the developing world has high population growth. Um, and, um, you know, it's an economic in uh, necessity for them. But as countries get w uh, wealthier, um, their population growth diminishes in any case. But still, we're seeing an almost doubling of population over the century. Uh, also, uh, the world is getting wealthier, and that's a good thing, all right? 
uh, wealth has been terribly badly distributed and it will still be in 2100, but overall um, in real terms adjusted for inflation, uh, incomes and GDP and economic activity, um, primarily in the developed world, but also everywhere, are likely increased by a factor of seven. Uh, access to money with which to buy fossil fuels is likely to skyrocket. And that's one of the driving factors here. Uh, continuing on, energy intensity of GDP, all right? Uh, everybody's uh, economy is going to be transitioning away from a manufacturing dominated one, this forecast predicts, and towards one more focused on services and low energy intensity um, economic sectors. Uh, and that will reduce the amount of energy used per dollar of GDP uh, by about a factor of three. And finally, in this business as usual scenario where we aren't taking aggressive action to limit global warming, uh, the carbon intensity of energy, the amount of carbon to produce one gigawatt uh, hour of electricity doesn't really change very much. So basically what we're seeing is over the course of the century, um, real human wealth is rising rapidly access to resources is rising rapidly. And so consumption of resources is rising rapidly. But at the same time, the transformation of economies from dirty, heavy industry towards the service sector is allowing more and more wealth to be made with less and less energy. Um, population growth is also an important factor, but it's that wealth, that rise in wealth that allows population to begin to tail out. Uh, towards 2100. So there's multiple competing factors here. Just to scroll back again, uh, once again, when we talk about uh, the Kaya identity, we're talking about the interlinked effects of population, wealth, um, what kind of economy you have, and what energy sources you're using on overall carbon emissions. So uh, that's enough for that, and I'll have more information on this for you soon. Thanks for listening.